nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. So, Happy New Year to everyone. I'm glad to uh, present uh, to you NanoHub and uh, semiconductor applications um, that helped for in teaching and learning. Um, I'll start out with uh, the NanoHub homepage, of course. Uh, NanoHub.org is really serving students, researchers, and instructors. We have quite a following globally, over 2.1 million annual visitors. And we really uh, try to do four things. Uh, we want to enable people to model and simulate. That is really our, our core competence. And we have over 500 apps that are relatively easily usable. We have more complex tools uh, that we, we host as well. And um, you can see there's a listing of most popular items on the homepage too. We want to enable learning and teaching. And uh, there we have structured and globally used resources. And today I'll be talking about what we call simulation powered curricula courses uh, that are typically being taught at uh, the undergrad and the graduate level uh, that can be enhanced by modeling and simulations. We also have courses and lectures and other curated materials in that domain. We also want to enable people to develop software in the nanotechnology arena. Uh, so we provide resources for that, like Jupyter Notebooks, Linux workstations, and we host a couple of engines and frameworks that enable uh, nano researchers to, to leverage existing resources and hook their tools into it. And ultimately, we would like to pe have people uh, contribute into NanoHub with their new tools or their lectures or their homework assignments, etc. So share and publish is also one of our key uh, agendas or key items we would like to foster. So if I go here on this simulation powered curriculum, uh, I will reach a a page that that really lists a, a variety of resources for a couple of different courses, uh, course types, and uh, that deal with, uh, that are really simulation part learning activities. That's what we call it. And we have a couple of these uh, tool sets and Abacus is the uh, tool for understanding semiconductors. So if I click on this, I'll, I'll get a brief overview in this group page. And here is Abacus. The group page. So, what is Abacus? It really embeds a bunch of tools that are available on NanoHub that uh, allow for a one stop shop, so to speak. If you're teaching semiconductors, you probably cover crystal structures and lattices, you cover band structure and, uh, um, and band models, you probably deal with bulk semiconductors, PN junctions possibly bipolar junction transistors, MOS capacitors, and, and MOSFETs. So each of these is really a concept that is typically taking a week or a week and a half in a typical course uh, throughout a typically 15 week semester course. And uh, today I would wanna talk about bulk semiconductors like uh, this tool here. And uh, if, I, if I click on here, uh, I'll, I'll go to the sub page that deals with Drift Diffusion Lab on Abacus. And that is what we'll focus on today. And if I click on this, it'll actually go to the page that is no longer the group page that has homework assignments, etc., but is really the Abacus tool. And so if I launch this tool here, you have to log in. Login is free. You can log in with um, your university credentials or with your Gmail account. Here is the Abacus tool. And as I mentioned, it's an assembly of different tools that you might use throughout your semester when you're teaching semiconductors. So here's a graphical representation of what is an Abacus. So we have crystals, we have band structure, a periodic potential lab. Uh, we can show how band structure emerges out of transmission coefficients bulk band structure or a thin body band structure. There's a carrier statistics lab. Today I'll be talking about the drift diffusion lab. 
and I already presented Pian Junction Lab. And next week I'll be presenting the Bipolar Junction Lab and subsequently the MOS Capacitor Lab and the MOSFET Lab. So today I want to focus here on this Drift Diffusion Lab. And what you saw in between pop up here is uh, there's actually a couple of homework assignments you can adopt into your class. And uh, they deal really with a tool and um, uh, what kind of information you can extract. So here, if I click on this, it will pop up a, a resource on NanoHub. Um, and I can download this PDF. And this really is uh, created for this tool uh, for somebody in 305 or 606 at Purdue. Uh, that are teaching semiconductor in the undergrad and the grad level. And it'll walk you through concept of diffusion and diffusion links and how you can do some of these experiments. And that is what I'm going to try to show today. Um, so I'll, I'll go in here into the Drift Diffusion Lab. And there's really uh, uh, five different experiments you can run. You can apply a, a voltage to the semiconductor slab, and it has a structure to it. It has a length you can set. You can set the type of doping. You can look at uh, just electron hole or ambipolar transport. Um, you can modify the material, so you can look at silicon, germanium, and gallium arsenide. And you can set some properties in these materials. Uh, a mobility model that might have been assigned here in this underlying tool. The underlying tool is called Padre, which is an industrial strength tool, which originally was uh, developed at Bell Labs. So Padre actually helped design transistors for Bell Labs in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, so it's a real tool. It's not a just an educational um, app per se, but under the hood of this app, is actually a full-fledged semiconductor device modeling tool that commands some trust and um, in the community. So uh, you can set environmental variables like the temperature and the applied voltage, um, number of bias points, and you can uh, change some more detailed parameters like the surface recombination rates on the left and the right contact. And uh, what I like to do is Go in here and look at an experiment uh, that is typically being done analytically. But uh, so here you can apply bias. You can just shine light on top of a semiconductor. And that's typically what's being done in analytical solution. Uh, you can uh, shine light in from the left edge and see uh, various effects there. And you can combine uh, the two of uh, having a voltage applied and shine light on it. And that's sort of where I want to march towards today. But let me start out with just shining light on the top. So that's the experiment I want to run. Uh, again, I'm looking at a slab that's 0.5 uh, micrometer long. I'm just going to look at intrinsic material. And um, Uh, I'm going to look at silicon and typical minority of care lifetime is here at one microsecond. So that's quite, quite all right. And uh, the thing to look at here is the generation rate. How hard do you hit this material with, uh, carry, uh, with light? How many carriers are you generating? And in what uh, region are you generating it? So this thing is 0.5 micron long. And by default, it says it uh, let's start shining light from 0.1 micron to 0.4 micron. And I'm going to make it in a very relatively narrow range. So I'm going to pick just uh, half a micron out in the middle of the device, about 2.5. So I'm going to set this point 2.75 plus minus um, 0.25 micron. So really. I want to uh, shine light in, in this pretty narrow uh, spatial region. So you can think of a slit. Uh, typically in class, you might have the whole slab lit up and uh, calculate uh, the, um, the charge distribution in it. So here in this, in this numerical tool, you can do a little bit more. So uh, let's hit simulate here. 
And what's happening now, it's uh, assembling an input deck for Padre, and it's running Padre. And it comes back with an energy band diagram. So here's the conduction band, here's the quasi Fermi level, and here's the valence band. So not much has happened uh, here in the conduction band, and we'll dive into why this might be. So let's look at the uh, uh, doping, the, the electron density here. So what we're doing is we're hitting the system slightly with light. And um, uh, the intrinsic carrier density is roughly 10 to the 10 in silicon. And at the surface, you have recombination. So the carriers are, the excess carriers are recombining. And you see a hole density, uh, electron density and a hole density. And the, uh, uh, the, the two are different because actually the mobility of these two material uh, of electrons or holes are different. So uh, you can look at the excess carrier density under uh, non-equilibrium. So he, this is the difference between uh, the intrinsic carrier density in electrons and holes here. And you see how they basically um, basically decay at the edges. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the system harder. And obviously, I should be getting more minority carriers. And I can compare those two in a minute. So uh, what you also see now here and first is you see a modification of the quasi Fermi level. It's getting modulated slightly. And we'll dive into that, why that might be. And uh, so let me look at the net carrier, um, the excess charge carrier density here, and compare that to the previous case, and I can actually put them on the same chart. So if I hit the system harder with more light, I generate more excess carriers. That's kind of reasonable. And again, they basically decay roughly linearly towards the edge of the slab, which is kind of what an analytical solution would give you um, as, as you can calculate it. Um, if I now hit the system even harder, Oh, yeah, let me hit the system harder uh, with more light, so more generations of carriers. I actually now see, um, if I compare these simulations, this is the quasi Fermi level of when I'm hitting the system hard. And what you see is the quasi Fermi level actually changing. And the quasi Fermi level indicates the charge away from the, the natural um, equilibrium. And this is the, um, the electron quasi Fermi level that is being shown here. So we have excess electron uh, uh, density here in the middle of the device, and then it decays out to the edge. And again, here is the excess carrier density. I can compare the, all of them. And the harder I hit them on, an, on a logarithmic scale, as you see, the more carriers I can get. Now. So that makes sense, and this aligns reasonably well with analytical solutions. You can already see that uh, this curve here on the hitting it strong with light is no longer perfectly linear. Now let's um, play a little bit and ask ourselves, what happens if you modify the material a little bit? What if you have, for example, uh, more recombination centers in the device. Sometimes that might be interesting to do for, for real practical purposes. And what if you shorten the life? Well, first of all, I'm going to do, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to uh, leave it with a system where I hit it hard um, with carriers. I'm going to clear this out and go back to just hitting it not so hard. And um, I'm going to rerun this real quick. Here's the result. Here's a slight modification. Now I'm going to um, assume I'm going to introduce recombination centers in the device. And I'm going to make the lifetime of the electrons and the holes really short, really, really short. What, what should happen is that uh, the diffusion length should become rather small. And the curves of the distributions of the uh, carriers should be slightly different. So let me compare that here again, excess carrier density, 
And now you can see that your carrier density is now decaying somewhat exponentially, no longer linearly uh, compared to the previous case. So if I here put them together, if there's a really, really fast recombination, that means the diffusion length in this device is, is really short. That means your carrier distributions will follow different uh, behaviors as you could expect it. So you can uh, walk your students into some numerical experiments like this, where you can uh, really explore the analytical solutions, but compare them to more realistic solutions. What's, what's harder to do is then also applying a bias. So if I go back to um, making this a microsecond, Oh, millisecond it was, right? I don't think it matters. It's it's really happening at the picosecond scale. I'm going to make it back to a millisecond. I'm going to clear this. Clear all. Show this result again. And now I want to uh, play a little bit uh, in terms of sweeping the carriers over uh, with an applied bias. So here I've modified the quasi-Fermi level. Again, here is the excess carrier density. Here is the, the net charge density. So I have extra charge available. And my electrostatic potential is only slightly modified. So it's really, that's why the, the electrostatic potential looks almost flat. The correction here is here in the order of 0.2 microelectron volts. So, so very small, uh, which also makes sense. But now, um, here you see the electric field that is uh, commensurate with uh, hitting the, char um, the system with, a, with light. And now what I'd like to do is actually modify the experiment and begin uh, not only applying uh, light, but also applying a voltage across. And that now means that as I create carriers, even with a slight voltage, which I'm going to set here at 0.2 volts, I'm going to start sweeping those carriers across. And I'm first, I'm going to hit the system really lightly. I'm going to hit it with just 10 to the 18, which is almost no light, so to speak. And I can calculate an IV curve of a slab of a semiconductor that's lightly illuminated. And you should see the response of um, roughly a resistor. This is intrinsic material. Remember, this is, um, we chose um, the environment here to be intrinsic. So there's no doping in this device and we apply a small voltage. Now I'm going to hit the system harder so i'm going to go up by 10 to the 20 and what i should see of course is an increased amount of current where the electrons get swept into one side and the holes get swept onto the other side of the device and if i compare the two curves here indeed 10 to the 20 is still a very light illumination if i now hit it um another two orders of magnitude harder, you'll see how um, the current will increase significantly because there's more carriers to be swept across the device into different directions. And you also see sort of how there's a saturation that is happening in the device. So he, down here below, this device is roughly still linear. Uh, here, uh, we're basically sweeping all the carriers we can get, um, and some of the carriers are, uh, are already recombining. And we can kind of see that also if we go into the device here again. And if we change the, uh, the carrier lifetime again, if we're just saying, well, we hit the system in the middle, but now we're going to let a bunch of them decay on, on the way to the left and the right contact. And what that means is we hit the system with light, but we lose carriers that don't make it to the edge. That should mean that the current gets smaller. And this is here what happens. So if I really um, 
have a really, sh really short lifetime. Basically, the carriers, not all of them make it, and it looks almost like a resistive type device like this. So we can really uh, look at um, a different uh, device property. So let me look here at the uh, the excess carrier density and the non-equilibrium, and I had shown this to you. But now I can look at this under different biases, and I can really see how the charge is being swept into different uh, directions. So here, the electrons go to the left contact, the holes go into the right contact, and this is the case where I made the recombination rate rather uh, fast, right? So we have this exponential decay here. I go to this case here where we have uh, uh, pretty long or normalish um, a minority carrier lifetime, we can uh, now look at the distribution here at zero bias, and then we can see how the carriers are being swept in. And um, basically, you see all of the electrons that are being generated make it to the left contact. They do decay, continue to decay to the right. And basically, all the holes, almost all the holes, make it to the right contact. And the difference, of course, between the electrons and the holes is that they have different mobilities. Um, electrons have typically a higher mobility than uh, the, the holes. You can, just for argument's sake, play with that and maybe make the mobility the same. And let's, let's mess up the mobility really badly. Let's crop, introduce so much crud into the device that the mobility is low. So now we're going to run this again. And first of all, I would expect that the electron and hole distributions are the same because the mobilities are now uh, the same. Let's look at the um, excess carrier. See, and the distributions are the same. We have a really fast uh, recombination. So you have this exponential decay. And um, Basically, you see uh, the electrons go to the right, uh, uh, left, and the holes go to the right, and they decay linearly. And if I go back to making this again, more like a millisecond, we should see how we really completely sweep uh, electrons to the left and holes to the right. And we kind of have a loop in explaining basic device physics in a slab of a semiconductor. And um, so here we go again, uh, the distribution here, and you see how under high bias, we basically sweep everybody to the left. And since the uh, minority care lifetime is, is pretty long, some of the electrons also go still to the right contact, and some of the holes go to the right contact. But if, if you look at that proportion, it's a factor of three or so. So basically, we're sweeping electrons to the left and holes to the right. So this is about a half an hour of well, maybe 20 minutes of me explaining this tool. Um, I, I, be very happy to entertain questions or concerns. That gives us some 15 minutes in a 45 minute session. And I'll entertain questions as you have them, so. All right, great. Uh, we did get a couple questions in the chat. The first one being, is there a way to zoom in and out on the graph? Oh yeah, no, that's, that's actually very easy. You just, boom, you zoom in and out. You can also modify the scales here. You can, um, uh, click back on automatic. You can also change whether it's a logarithmic or linear scale. Um, so, so yeah, the, the tool is uh, reasonably flexible in that. Let me open this a little bit more, make it bigger. Um, and you can zoom in and out. And oh, I didn't say that in this session. Uh, if you do want to get some of this data, you can click on this download button up here, and it lets you download um, either data as um, comma separated values. So if you can massage it by yourself, or uh, you can actually download an image. 
and in in different formats for example eps ps uh, jpeg or png and you can if it's an eps for example i typically end up mocking in illustrator and adding some labels etc but we really try to make these graphs here publication quality type graphs so they're not just uh, cruddy screenshots all right another question that came in via chat at higher lifetime both kind of charge carriers are moving toward the electrodes what is the benefit of this I'm, i don't know that i would connect a benefit uh, from that if if the lifetimes are long that means uh, you have uh, less recombination between electrons and holes so you have less uh, um, SRH um, uh, recombinations from electrons and holes and that means um, there's more carriers that can diffuse to the edges uh, if the lifetime is really short then um, uh, you go back to the case here um, where you can sort of see you can sort of see that most of the carriers that the light generates don't make it to the contact right they they recombine before they can diffuse out versus if you uh, have a long a longer uh, lifetime uh, carriers recombine and diffuse and then um, the boundary conditions on this slab are ohmic boundary conditions or they have a surface recombination rate that basically absorbs all the extra uh, carriers so so any hole that makes it to the left or the right uh, is uh, is is destroyed so to speak in the ohmic contact with this uh, surface recombination velocity so i i wouldn't assign a benefit to it it's more like the physical mechanisms that are happening in this slab of semiconductor we can talk about why you might want to have short lifetimes or long lifetimes um, that's slightly different maybe that's the right question that is underneath Uh, we'll give him time to ask again if he has uh, more to the question, but we do have some other questions. What is happening with the carrier concentrations at the contacts? There was a little increase in the minority carrier concentration in one of the examples shown. So, so here is an example, right? I'm applying a voltage. Um, at the end, at the at the contact ultimately uh, the boundary condition is that uh, minority carriers are going to zero that's at least a typical analytical solutions um if we can mess with the uh, surface recombination velocities these are terms that uh, people have measured on on surfaces or on these ohmic contacts we can make those rates or these uh, velocities uh, much higher. So uh, then uh, the excess carriers will hit zero faster. But here, basically, this is the net charge density under equilibrium. And at the contacts, you hit zero. So whatever you do in the middle of the device by light, at the ohmic contacts, they will get um, destroyed or annihilated in the quantum mechanical sense. All right, the next question. Recombination lifetimes can vary with the photo generation rate as high injection or low injection. Do we need to incorporate these differences through carrier lifetimes, or is there a way to see this behavior in the drift diffusion lab? The drift diffusion lab should peel that out automatically in the sense that um, I was trying to highlight that. Let me clear all of this and see if I can uh, on the fast generate this. So, um, and two, oh, let me 
back to some 1200 and 450, I think it was here. Uh, and let me not hit the system so hard. Let me hit it just 21. That would probably be a low injection. Um, so what we should see is um, that basically the, the carriers drop linearly in the system uh, at charge density. So basically they drop linearly. Now, if you hit the system really hard, you should introduce nonlinear, okay, nonlinear effects. And uh, these curves will no longer be quite linear. So this uh, Padre tool, I would think, actually captures these nonlinear effects uh, reasonably well. So you see how there's actually a curvature here um, that is different from. Uh, the uh, problem is I can't compare the curves like this. Um, let me go in here. So here is my excess carriers, and basically, under zero bias, it's linear. Under um, zero bias, high injection, it becomes nonlinear. So I believe it's captured. Um, but I, I must admit, I'm not excessively familiar with the details of this drift diffusion code. And I know you can uh, modify quite a bit in this. So here's the actual input deck that goes with this tool. And you can turn on and off all kinds of models. Uh, explicitly. So um, I must admit, I'm not totally familiar if there are specialized models for high injection uh, in this tool. Uh, I would think they're turned on, but I'm not totally sure. So I'm sorry. All right. Thanks, Gerhard. The next question, is there somewhere that lists all the equations involved? Um, Somewhat. There is a Padre manual how to operate this tool. And that manual actually does explain the variety of models, mobility models, etc. Um, and I would argue that this is a, a pretty sophisticated tool. So there's a variety of models that can be turned on and off. It's not just um, simple quote unquote simple drift diffusion it goes way beyond um the things that you might calculate on paper with paper and pencil with uh, with um differential equations so i i wouldn't argue that there is say a, a sheet that describes all the equations sort of in one compact form this is truly a, a design tool under the hood but fundamentally of course it solves the drift diffusion equation all right. The next question, does the program account for lifetime dependence on illumination levels? That is similar to the question I, I, I thought I answered to before, right? I think it does, but I'm not completely sure. And the nonlinearity of the behavior seems to indicate it does. OK, another question from the chat. How do you arrange all the simulated graphs in a single window? Ah. Yeah. Um, you mean for, so what I, so in this tool, we have kind of one, uh, one view of the world of one, one result at a time. And this, this all button allows you to compare things. Uh, across graphs, etc. Um, if you, I've done animations and explanations of of tools. I ended up uh, for my students making um, multiple screenshots, and then I put them into an animated GIF. For example, uh, that's a reasonably tedious process. So. Um, 
and the next generations of the tools were actually starting to put together panels of graphs that tend to belong together and put them next to each other. In this tool, we don't have that. Okay, we have a couple questions that may have been related to a previous question. Uh, the first one being, does the amount of carriers that makes it to the electrodes related to the current that is generated by a photovoltaic device? Oh yeah, that's exactly it, right? I mean, um, so here are um, the two IV characteristics uh, that are calculated, uh, one with 2E21 illumination, one with 222, uh, two, two times 10 to the 22. Uh, there's more current flowing and Basically, you can certainly see that um, the excess carriers under bias here, you can see uh, all of these basic, quote unquote, all of these um, uh, holes make it to the right. All of these electrons make it to the left. And um, those current contributions from the holes and the electrons make up the total current. So, uh, so you see the total current here, and that is made up of electron and hole current on the left and the right contact. Um, I guess we could try a, a sort of interesting experiment that I haven't done. What if you just look at one type of transport? I'm not sure I want to go on this thin ice, but it's always good to make a fool of yourself, right? So what if I just do the same thing and I just look at electrons? I haven't done this experiment, so I haven't played with this option on uh, the light. So I'm wondering what actually happens. So so this, this is strange, right? So you have actually, well, no, you have current um, flowing um, under zero bias, that's interesting, right? But you're hitting it with light. Um, and here is the excess carrier density. So we're just looking at the electrons and they're going this way. And holes are just not even treated properly as transport. So yeah, so you, you treat uh, properly electron and hole current at the left and the right contact. And electrons and holes can go to the left and right contact. Um, uh, depending on the recombination rate, so it's properly treated. I hope that answers the question. All right, and the next question also might have been related to something you were talking about before. So the Omicron contact makes the number density intrinsic. Um, so, yeah, it's not everything is around COVID, right? It's the omic contact, <laughs> not Omicron, but joke on the side. Um, so, uh, yes. So, the basically, the omic contact at the edges brings back the structure to equilibrium value. We have chosen an intrinsic semiconductor. Therefore, uh, we are um, reestablishing uh, electron and hole densities uh, to be in equilibrium at the contacts. And that means um, we're going to the intrinsic values. So that, that is indeed true. Okay, the next one is more of a comment and maybe some feedback. They said, I don't teach solid state or device physics, but I do teach electronics for physics majors. One of the most difficult concepts for students is bipolar transistor action. I would love to have some simple simulations that would nail this down for students. All right, come back next week. We're going to talk about the BJT lab. That's exactly the focus here. Um, so here we're going to talk about bipolar junction transistor lab, where you can um, teach students these type of behaviors through a NPN or PNP. 
or uh, even a realistic geometry uh, like this where it might look like this so so for for uh, quote unquote physics introduction that is exactly what we're going to talk about next week the next question is it possible to simulate pin structures other than a photoconductor uh yes and that has been uh, part of the uh, previous uh, uh, discussion I presented. So here is uh, the PN junction lab, where you can look at you can look at PN junctions or PIN junctions. Um, there is also a recording of all of this, right? Um, go home here. So we have, I believe here, this recitation series, uh, we have some of the recordings here. So you can certainly listen to the presentation that I gave on PN junctions, where I walk through the PN junction simulations. So that's certainly available already. And today's session will show up here as number four. And the next question, could you use a modulated AC light excitation source? Not in the current implementation of this tool. And I'm not familiar enough with Padre whether in general this can be done. Um, it may. I am not totally sure. I mean, you'd like to see transient behavior, et cetera. So I I do not know if you can have a time modulated light excitation. I kind of doubt it, but I'm not sure. All right, uh, we do have a handful uh, more questions. The next one. Can you simulate the Haynes Shockley experiment? I'm not even familiar with that. I would have to Google it real quick. Give me. Yeah, I think this is basically what I have been doing. Um, so we consider an N type semiconductor of length D, so I can mobility of carriers, and if we do it to one dimension. I'm looking at Wikipedia right now, so I can just dump this here. All right, so we're going to look at an n-type semiconductor distance uh, length d, mobility of carrier diffusion, relaxation time, current densities, Gauss's law, Einstein relation. E. Yep. Hold on. So let's set this up. Here, all of this. So we're just talking in a one dimensional problem. We're going to look at apply bias. We're going to look at an N type semiconductor. This is reasonably low doping. I'm going to apply a small voltage. To leave everything else intact. And run this and we should roughly see a linear behavior and let's see what. Um, um, so here's my resistive type behavior that I would expect. And here is 
excess carriers, so it's mostly electrons because we're so why is this? Yep. So here we're sweeping the carriers, the electrons again to the left and the lack of electrons to the right. So I think basically we're simulating this experiments, this experiment. I hope that answers that question. All right, the next question. Could the simulation show resistivity versus the temperature relation? Resistivity. Um, so, yes, yeah, so let's do this. Um, we're going to repeat this experiment here, right? And I looked at an IV characteristic. And by is a small, it's pretty linear. And now let's crank down this to 200 Kelvin for argument's sake and compare these um, IV curves, and then you would have to extract the slope of this. And, um, and you get the resistivity out. And um, this is interesting why I would have intuitively thought at higher temperature, you get more current. I'm puzzled, let me think. I can see that, why that might be. So this is a 300 Kelvin. Not sure. My intuition is not working well on that. It's at least consistent. It's maybe the band gap changing. Yeah. So the band gap is also changing as a function of temperature. That changes things a little bit. But that shouldn't make much difference. I am not sure. I'm not sure. I have to think about that a little bit. But in principle, you can extract resistance as a function of temperature, for sure. All right. The next question, is the low injection, high injection behavior for direct band gap materials also incorporated? Yes. So I do know um, you can choose uh, gallium arsenide. That's a direct gap material. I know the author of the code has worked on gallium arsenide devices, and I'm sure they have included it. So, yes. Okay, great. The next question is, can we use Padre to combine the PN Junction lab with the Drift Diffusion lab? For example, if we want to shine light on a PN Junction. Yes, you may. Absolutely. And the way you would do that is um, you can you can pull down the input pr the um, uh, the meshing and the full information of how to run this tool in a slab. Uh, you can go in here in the PN Junction Lab and uh, see how an input deck is assembled. Here, apply a voltage, and then you can go into the tool hard ring and truly launch this tool, the full fledged tool, and have your students or yourself or your TA really assemble an input deck. So here is the PN junction. And then you can shine light in certain regions. So this is the same PN junction um, simulation as um,
there's electrostatic potential for two bias, valence band, conduction band. So this is the full-fledged tool, and you can you can mess with it to your heart's delight. So this is exposing you to to really the the full tool capabilities. The unfortunate thing is you you really have to learn the garbage language to do that. We have not built a tool, which we could, I presume, or you can help us build this tool to shine light on a PN junction, etc. So th those would be natural extensions that could be done, certainly. Okay, great. We have a couple more questions, if you're all right on time, Gerhard. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the next one, does this allow for high-level injection in intrinsic silicon? Can you change the dimension of this lab? Yes. Um, go back to here. So what you can change is you can change the length of the slab. Um, you can change, oh, this is, oh. Um, let me clear, let me go back to, I ran this for an N-type semiconductor. The question was the resistivity of an, um, in ooh, IV, interesting. All at cold temperature, it doesn't. This at cold temperature, there's just no carriers. It's not going to converge very well. That's interesting. Clear 200 Kelvin. So, um, so you can change the, the length of the slab. You can change where you inject the light. Um, yeah, interesting. Ooh, can I take out, please? Um, so that's the limitation here. In in principle, again, in pottery, you can make things way more complicated, but this is a, a one-dimensional representation. I hope that ends. So again, structure, you can make the slab wider or shorter, and then you can crank up the... Um, Yeah, for the intrinsic, it, it does the, the things that I expected. For higher temperature, you have more carriers. It's a much simpler physics. So, so that was on the previous question where I was like, why is the current going up as a function of, uh, as temperature goes down? Um, sorry, I was answering two questions. Uh, that, so again, you can make this slab shorter and we can, for example, make it as short as you want, or we can really, um, if we go into this experiment here of shining light and applying a bias, so we can So we can really shine light throughout the whole slab and really um, have um, extremely high level of injection if we really um, um, if we really hit the system hard like this. And I want to make sure I clear all temperature three hundred going back to something that's more normal. So here. And uh, now we're hitting the system very hard over the whole slab. Um, and that should result in high level injection and the IV characteristic doesn't look right. Why is this? So we're really high on the holes. And this looks right. Okay. 
this is I mean this looks right for the the electrons and this looks right for the holes and the level of ejection is so high that holes also make don't just go to the to the right they also go to the left similar to the electrons they don't just go to the left they also go to the right so to me that looks right um yeah and here we are separating electron and hole uh quasi fermi levels quite a bit to, to the high level injection so this looks right and see we're not even getting truly back to the intrinsic level because the injection is so high and the recombination velocity is not fast enough so that makes sense all right, thanks, Gerhard. That actually concludes all of the questions that we received. Okay. All right. Um, so I I thank you very much for the demo. Hopefully this is useful. Uh, again, you have my contact information on my calendar. You can also find me by email, I'm sure, and contact me if you have further questions. I'll be very happy to to help you in introducing Abacus into your class. So thank you very much.